Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series for the first three months of 2018 entitled Stewardship, Motives of the Heart. And this first lesson is entitled The Influence of Materialism. This is the lesson for January 6th of 2018. We hope that you'll enjoy these lessons, their challenge, I can tell you already. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we stop and take a look at the situation in the world in which we live, and even among your church members, even among your dedicated people, the challenges of trying to separate ourselves from the forces that seem to control our world. In these lessons, we will see that um, that's not going to be easy. It hasn't been easy. Help us to learn some important things from our time together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you could guess, uh, this lesson is going to focus on the challenges of living in a very materialistic society while still trying to maintain true Christianity. And our lesson starts out with Romans 12, actually 1 and 2, but primarily 2 we're going to look at right now. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him, and is perfect. Okay, being transformed. Well, do you need to be rich in order to experience the love of money? No. I didn't take long to answer, did it? Who are more susceptible to the love of money? That might be a little more difficult. Is it the rich or the poor? And what does it mean to be conformed to this world? Well, everybody loves money because it gives you power and stuff, you know, at least in a material, uh, carnal sense. So whether you're poor and you want some, or or you're rich and you want more, it's it's all about... Uh, I see. Is there anything wrong with being rich? Abraham was rich. Yeah. So what you do with it is where it really... That's right. ...where he meets the road. Is it wrong to work hard to get ahead? Working hard should never be wrong, I don't think, if you're, if you're doing it honestly. We do have the story of the rich young ruler, who, yes. which has a bad connotation, but many other of the saints of the Bible were rich, as, yeah. as have been mentioned. And I won't ask you, I won't answer, I won't ask any of you to answer this question yourself, but you out there, have you ever been tempted to try to get more money just for the pursuit of money itself? One worldly wise soul once said, money isn't everything, but it's way ahead of whatever's in second place. <laughs> Probably heard that one before. So why is money so attractive? And Dennis already gave us a clue. Money could buy just about anything. It is a form of instant gratification for many people, but it can never meet or deal with our greatest needs. Well, so... Should we just start off by saying, would you agree that money has become the god of this world? Anybody want to argue with that? I has think become? I think it always, it always has, has been. been. <laughs> <It> always <laughs> has been. Okay. Well, in reality, in reality, materialism is the religion of money. And we quote from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, materialism is a sophisticated and insidious system that offers temporary security but no ultimate security that's the lesson for sunday december 31. ultimate what? safety i'm sorry thank you ultimate safety what do you suppose that's talking about what's the ultimate safety it's talking about the ultimate safety like, well, like the, depending on your bank account instead of god is that well, gets, is that it it's partly that it depends on whether your nation's currency is worth anything or not. That is also true. And uh, if you look at the current situation, uh, people are starting to turn to more gold and silver and the likes. 
It's, that's one of the old, old bastions against going broke. Yeah. Buy back as you want to look. You know, I wondered, wonder about this definition of materialism. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be treated in this, this, um, but this quarterly, like, just as money? Is that what it is? Because well, to me, materialism is a lot more than that. Yeah. I mean, you've got belief systems. You've got, you've got people who don't believe in spiritual things at all. So when you're like that, you're a materialist as far as I'm concerned. It's not really, it's not really a based on money right there mm -hmm. either. So is that what we're going to talk about in this quarter? We're, we're going to make gonna several, money? He's gonna talk about several suggestions money. about what materialism might include in these couple, first couple lessons, such as what, what I've done, yeah. really worked on yeah. so far. Um, why is it, do you think, that it seems that the more we have, the more money we have, the more we seem to want? Is it uh, some kind of a disease? Well, there's always another thing over the hill or... You buy, somebody buys a big house and then they realize that it costs more to heat that and cool it and, and you need more helpers to, to do the gardening and, and clean the house and so then, then you need more money to, to fund that and you know, things just can get out of hand. I recently visited uh, St. Petersburg in Russia and looking at some of the history of some of the things there there was a church that Peter, one of the early czars, decided, the head of the Romanovs, decided he wanted to build this special church in this special place. He needed 500,000 workers to build that church. Mm. Five, we, we, I can't even imagine. I mean, and obviously they were, a lot of them were out in different places collecting materials and so forth, but 500,000 workers? I mean, <laughs> Where would you put them all? Anyway. Hmm. Well, Solomon once wrote in Ecclesiastes 5.10, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Is that true? Well. I, th in, I okay. think your earlier quote summed it up pretty well. And one of America's black female singers said the same thing. Hmm. Except she said, I've been poor and I've been rich and I know which I like the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. Yeah. Well, John, the beloved disciple in, the God, in, in one of his epistles, 1 John 2, 16 and 17, put it like this. Everything that belongs to the world, and we're going to look at this verse in more detail later, but everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. So um, he had apparently a fairly... How many people really think of in, the, in those terms? Because, yeah. you know, it could be a, a quite an impediment to one's e eternal future if they're well off financially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if everything, if things going swimming, let's take the story of Job. Basically, the oldest philosophy there is: if you're well off financially and your health is good, it's because God's smiling on you. Yeah. And uh, if you're well off in those areas, why would you par change your paradigm? Why would you want to look at things any different? Because everything's going good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it could be uh, a great uh, changing paradigms is a very painful. In, in some respects. Uh, I'm going to read a passage, that, a quote from Jesus himself, that's pretty stark and pretty scary. Uh, it's in, found in Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 26. <coughs> those who come to me and cannot be my, uh, those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother wife, children, brothers, sisters, and themselves as well. Now, the golden rule says we're supposed to love other people as we love ourselves, but Jesus says you're not supposed to love yourself. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. And every time I read a passage like that, I wonder, 
What did the disciples think Jesus was talking about when he mentioned the cross? They had no concept that there was going to have anything to do with the cross. It had nothing to do with us or what's going to happen to us. But anyway, he said that. If one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and work out what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation, and all who see what happened will laugh at you. This man began to build, but can't finish the job, they will say. Then I'm going to drop down um, to verse... Uh, I'm sorry. I guess we can go ahead and read this. If a king goes out with 10,000 men to fight, another king who comes against him with 20,000 men, he will sit down first and decide if he's strong enough to face that other king. If he isn't, he will send messengers to meet the other king to ask for terms of peace while he's still a long way off. In the same way, concluded Jesus, none of you can be my disciples unless you give up everything you have. Now, is that, is that a fair thing to, to demand of us? Is it in the nature of a demand or is it just a, a declaration of how things function? You know, if, if your priorities are a certain way, it's pretty tough to look at it from another angle. What does he mean by give up everything? Does that mean uh, I, I used to live, as I, I have mentioned before, in Africa, and there's some pretty poor people out there in the rural areas. Does that mean they don't have to give up much? Well, whatever we have needs to be, uh, we need to acknowledge that it's, it's the Lord's, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, it's this, you know, it's not like I give my 10% so I can do whatever I mm -hmm. want with the rest. Um, so uh, I think he's talking about not holding on because mm -hmm. uh, he, he uses the term uh, seeking to save your life and lose your life and such mm -hmm. in other places. You know, the thing is that there's a point where we're all going to die and we're going to lose everything then. Yeah. So that kind of tells you your situation right there and that's kind of what you got to keep in mind. So is Jesus trying to say, okay, in your own mind at least, measure your, your, your desire, your want, your love for things here on this world, even if they're good things, as compared to your love and desire for a place in heaven, for a fellowship with God himself? Is that what he's trying to say? It's about valuing things. Uh, like in the first quote you had, you, you take it from the good news where it says, if you love me more than the, uh, my disciples, unless they love me more than... In other translations, it, it says, the, uh, unless you hate me, mm -hmm. hate them, uh, hate his own father and mother and uh, yeah. wife and children. And the margin here, they they sort of try to explain that by comparison of his love for me. In other yeah. words, uh, their value versus the value of, of Jesus and what he's doing. Yeah. We have to make that those comparisons, which is where the thought of the king going out to battle and, and trying to decide whether or not, mm -hmm. you know, there's any chance that that he's going to win this or not. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that uh, when it comes to eternal life, what we have is not going to win it. <laughs> yeah. We have to, to come to God and say, this is, it's, is your, it's your will. Yeah. Isn't it a bit like Lot's wife? We have to be able to turn our back on it. And she didn't, and look what yeah. happened to her. Yeah. There's an interesting quotation coming up here in, in um, Education, written by Ellen White, pages 74 and 75. Carrie, could you read that for us? I could. When Christ came to the earth, humanity seemed to be fast reaching its lowest point. The very foundations of society were undermined. Life had become false and artificial. The Jews, destitute of the power of God's word, gave to the world mind-benumbing, soul-deadening traditions and speculations. The worship of God in spirit and in truth, quote-unquote, had been supplanted by the glorification of men in an endless round of man-made ceremonies. 
Throughout the world, all systems of religion were losing their hold on mind and soul. Disgusted with fable and falsehood, seeking to drown thought, men turned to infidelity and materialism. Leaving eternity out of their reckoning, they lived for the present. Wow. Of course, that's talking about those days, not talking about our day, right? Certainly not talking about us. <laughs> <laughs> I think Not there's overtones. <laughs> well, uh, let's be honest now. I, I, if you listen to, to, to radio, you, you look at television, what's the current status of religion in our society? Pretty, pretty low on the... Pretty shaky. I mean, there, religions, unless there's a, a disaster and then everybody's supposed to pray, but if we're not having a disaster or some terror effect or something, then it's it's great party to make fun of religion, just about every way you can imagine. Well, so again, Gordon says this couldn't possibly apply to us. Well, what about this? Do you think that the, do the things that we own and the things that we want own us? How many people? ignore their responsibilities, their family, etc., work themselves to the bone so they can have a better car, a better house, something to show off. Wow. Well, look at Luke 12. I'm going to read a few verses from there. And he went on to say to them, watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because a person's true life is not made up of the things he owns, no matter how rich he may be. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was once a rich man who had land which bore good crops. He began to think to himself, I haven't anywhere to keep all my crops. What can I do? This is what I will do. He told himself, I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, where I can will store my corn and all my other goods. Then I will say to myself, lucky man, you have all the good things you need for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool, this very night you will have to give up your life. Then who will get all these things you have kept for yourself? And Jesus concluded, This is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves, but are not rich in God's sight. So do we have anybody doing that in our day? Oh, yeah. Well, in Old Testament times, People were bowing down to statues of wood and, and stone and gold and silver. Few of us today would be tempted to do that. But are we tempted to worship money which is just another form of gold and silver? Gary, I think there's a very interesting passage there from Prophets and Kings that maybe we could look at. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and His attributes and are truly serving a false god as were the worshippers of Baal. Many, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves to the influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and exalt the human. Wow, Prophets and Kings 177 and 178. Is that possible? You know, we look at those people in the Old Testament, the people who worship Baal, and we think, those fools. I mean, you know, no one today would be so stupid to do that, right? Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 10, says all these things happen for examples to you that we shouldn't crave. And, and he goes on and on there about some of the things that happen there, and, and we should take those as warnings not to get involved. I wonder how close some of the television programs that I understand are being offered at late hours of the night, I never stay up for that, but uh, would, go, would match up to some of the orgies that we read about in those pagan fertility cult religions. Well, think about the methodologies being used by retailers to get us to purchase their products. Here's another area. There are all sorts of strange techniques that have proved to be very successful. Retailers want us to think that real happiness is found in buying and using their products. So how much does God actually want us to have? 
with food and covering, let us therefore be content. Basics. <laughs> what about false concept of God? Yeah. Uh, how many, t uh, talk about TV, how many TV preachers are preaching? Remember the story of Job, you got mm -hmm. uh, f five preachers, you got Job speaking, you got uh, five other preachers, and 80% of the, well, the conversation was, was false. Mm -hmm. Ooh, like is that, does that ratio hold up today in preachers today? Probably. Probably even, maybe a little even less. Than How'd you get, you get that percentage? Well, four, four <laughs> of the guys were, were, were not telling the truth about God, right? Well, he could have been, could have been telling a lot of truth mixed in that's with a little deception. bit of bad stuff. That's, that's, that's the that's worst part. That's what's happened in Revelation 12 to 9, the deceiver of the whole world. And we're all exposed. We all have to sort things out. Yeah. yeah, well, I can get it even from uh, local. T or I, I don't want to get too close to. I yeah. thought of something you would, when earlier when you were talking about build bigger barns. We have two billionaires that I won't mention their names that are powerful enough to influence what happens to nations mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. you can read it in the paper nearly every day. Yeah. So how much does God actually want us to have? Well, you got the, the ten. Excuse me, the Lord's Prayer. He didn't. Uh, the 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 um, shopping list was rather short there in the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you got your daily bread and uh, be protected from the evil one, uh, you got the well, Psalms twenty three. Com compare that to uh, Deuteronomy eight ten to fourteen. Dennis, you want to take that on for us? You will have all you want to eat, and you will give thanks to the Lord your God for the fertile land that he has given you. Make certain that you do not forget the Lord your God. Do not fail to obey any of his laws that I am giving you today. When you have all you want to eat and have built good houses to live in, and when your cattle and sheep, your gold and silver, or silver and gold, and all your other possessions have increased, Make sure that you do not become proud and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. Uh, Was it a mistake for God to bless them? Maybe if they stayed poor. Now, why did God give Solomon so much riches? Mm -hmm. He didn't ask for riches. No. The riches led him astray. Mm -hmm. Women did too. Oh yeah, th them too. <laughs> Maybe the devil gave him the riches. Yeah. Can you think, and here's a real question I'd like each one of you to think about. Can you think of an instance at any time in history from ancient Bible times to the present where the accumulation of wealth or material possessions actually improved someone's love for God, his spirituality, or even his desire for heavenly and spiritual things? You don't think it can happen? I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to tell me, give me an example. Abraham? You think his wealth made him more loving of God? Well, if he didn't have the influence, uh, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. Yeah, and, and his wealth was uh, probably no doubt a, some kind of influence on the other people. Uh, we have read the quotation before that says that, you know, he had a thousand heads of households. And then what about Job? Yeah. I mean, Job, he's, he even said that he, he helped the poor and helped people. But the interesting thing about Job is the, what we know about him is mostly when he was sitting on a dung heap and scraping his sores. So both of those examples were rich and were very good people with great influence for, for God and for good. But was, is there a cause and effect relationship or is it two parallel different paths? Well, I don't think that riches would necessarily make you go to hell. Well, if you gave, gave thanks to God for the increase... Uh, whether it's uh, Jacob and his his uh, goats and and yeah. sheep and things, or or what you know, you could um, uh, like uh, Solomon gathered these proverbs and he says, "Keep 
uh, deception and lies far me, from me give me neither poverty nor riches. Now, he's probably accumulated this because he wasn't in a position to, to pray this prayer <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I will not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not, uh, not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. That's Proverbs 30, uh, 8 to 8 and 9. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're rich or poor. You're still going through some some bad things and good yeah. things and everything. It's one thing about rich people, though, they seem to have the power to affect, you know, lives more than That's than a poor person. Sometimes being poor will, will keep you on the straight and narrow because um, you don't have any other way to go. Yeah. Whereas a rich guy, he'd say, well, I don't feel very good. What can I do to cheer myself up? Mm -hmm. And um, and they can do all kinds of things that way and it doesn't really mean that um, they're going to succeed at what they were doing. What about somebody like Wilberforce? Mm -hmm. He was <clears throat> Pardon me, I don't remember. I think he was comfortable. I don't know that he was really rich, but he's the guy that influences, I remember, the British Parliament against slavery. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. took him some work, but he did it. Mm -hmm. You think of the effect that had on a lot of people. Yeah. Nicodemus was rich. Um, yeah. But I think Ellen White said he pretty much bankrupt himself yeah. Yeah. helping the, the fledgling church. Yeah. But again, both of those cases, I would say, these people saw a vision, they saw something they really committed their lives to, but it probably wasn't anything to do with their wealth. They, they ended up using their wealth to get to that goal, but the wealth didn't get them there. It wasn't the center of their attention. No. It was well, let me ask you a question. If a person has overcome, made his, you know, he's overcome the world, okay. does that mean that even if he gets rich, he's still overcome the world? Well, you didn't you suggest Abraham was an example? Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, very frequently advertisers use beautiful and attractive people to promote what they're selling. Often these people have nothing whatsoever to do with the product they're trying to sell. I mean, you might be selling tires and you have to have a beautiful woman in a bikini or something like this to sell tires, which is crazy. But subconsciously, they want us to think that if we buy their products, we will, ha we will be like those beautiful and attractive people. One of the most powerful motivators that advertisers use is sensuality. Why is that like poison for Christians who are struggling against the dangers of materialism? It appeals to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and boastful pride of life. Most temptations in our modern world come to us through our eyes. What did Jesus say about the use of our eyes? Something pretty scary that I think very few people have, you know, we like to, uh, we quote this and then we say, well, but that he didn't really mean that. This is what he said. The eyes are like a lamp for the body. Now, we don't have a problem with that part. If your eyes are sound, your whole body is full of light. Amen. No problem. But if your eyes are no good, your body will be in darkness. So if the light in your, you is darkness, how terrible dark it will be. And then elsewhere, he says, tear out that eye and throw it away. Is that, is that for real? Well, it was something that was not unknown necessarily in his time. I think it was a figure of speech to a certain extent mm -hmm. that illustrated what he was getting at. Well, it could symbolize other yeah. things, you know, <coughs> but, uh, but I'll, uh, just dealing with uh, the externals doesn't necessarily change the internals. Oh. That's the, and this uh, eye that, uh, that uh, floods our, our <coughs> body with full of light is not, uh, you know, there's the, the literal eye, but then mm -hmm. there's the figurative eye that is beholding yeah. God. And uh, so if what we're beholding is creating darkness, we need to get rid of mm -hmm. that. Well, it's it, kind of making a point of value, mm -hmm. don't yeah. you think? Yeah. That he's, he, look at, don't lose this. It's, you can w lose your eye, and, it, and it's still better to have this mm -hmm. type of thing. 
So it's kind of making a point on value. There are two very important people in the body who, in the Bible, I'm sorry, who lost their eyesight. Who are they? Everybody should be able to remember one of them. Paul, for a specific period of time. Well, I wasn't, I was thinking about permanently. Samson. Samson is the first one we think about. And he fell into the hands, and he, you know, was so foolish, he fell into the hands of the Philistines, and they gouged out his eyes. Do you remember who the other one was? Z Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. Yes. Yes, they cut they him took off him the out. Place. They took him out into the valley there. They killed all his children and all his princes and all his chief people and so forth like that in front of him, and then they gouged out his eyes. Oh, so you're talking about eyesight that gets taken away from you. Yeah. From Didn't somebody. they make him walk with a rope or lead him with a yes. rope? Well, for ways, yeah. Yes. But the person who was actually read, led by a rope for a long time was was uh, Jehoiachin, Ch Jehoiachin. Yeah. And he was taken all the way to Babylon and eventually was given a place at the king's table years later. So there could be a point made here that if they, if he didn't really value those things, there wouldn't be any point to kill all those people in front of him, and, you know, um, to punish him or make him. Well, he died soon thereafter. But yeah, I know, but but there wouldn't be any point in doing it if if he. Yeah, if he didn't hard care to for say. those people. If he didn't care for them, yeah, like that. So. Well. Why are people influenced by advertising? It's a psychological people, effect. Yeah. No. People somehow imagine in their wildest imaginations that somehow by, by getting this product, they're going to be able to gratify these wild imaginations. Think about the amount of wealth and time that is being spent as we speak in trying to convince people through the advertising agencies to buy things which are truly unnecessary. Well, here's a passage in Scripture that should give us something to think about, found in Galatians 5, verse 16. What I say is this, let the Spirit direct your lives and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants, and what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies, and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. Boy, that sounds like we've got a permanent war going on. Is that right? Pretty much. Every day we battle? Well, Paul said that he died daily. Yeah. Um. Okay. Gordon, there's another passage there found of Desire of Ages, page 668. Would you read that and see by comparison what that says? All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his, to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Wow. So how does that fit with the idea that everything we want is in at war with what the Spirit wants. This says that we can actually come to be enough like Jesus Christ that we will want what He wants, we will choose to do what He chose to do, and we will just, you know, sin will actually become hateful to us. But even in Jesus' life, the going to the cross at the end was a struggle for Him. It wasn't, He, he wanted to do God's will and He brought the matter to God and said, never, uh, you know, if this cup can pass, uh, may it do, do so, but nevertheless, thy will be done, you know. So 
there, it doesn't mean that there aren't struggles, particularly. I don't know that Jesus struggled greatly <coughs> over, you know, the lusts of the flesh and, and various things there, but there is this protectiveness about <laughs> our life, you know, and uh, to be able to lay down our life. So I, I think sometimes uh, the fears are more of what we uh, would have to struggle with than, than necessarily the pleasures, mm -hmm. uh, pleasure aspects. I, maybe I shouldn't even think about this, but don't you think just about every young woman around Jesus would have wanted to marry him? Myra, do you want to comment about that? <laughs> I think that was probably something that was going on with the women. You know, they were attracted to his wow. yeah. influence, yes. to his, not his being, but mm -hmm. his uh, influence he had. His I think it's, what? His personality, his yeah. character. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm thinking in terms of Jesus versus what else is available. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm going too far, but boy, it just seems to me like, yeah. and so. Didn't we, didn't Ellen White say somewhere that he was not that attractive? Right. Well, we're not, I'm not the talking about, says that I'm not, too. Yeah. it wasn't the physical attraction, yeah. but it was the yeah. depth of his character yeah. and, 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 and the kind of person he was. I mean, he was always so kind and considerate and so forth. How could you not be attracted to him? Yeah. Well, what, okay, now let's look at the other side. <laughs> what led to Satan's fall in heaven? Self-centeredness. Yes. He used to be called Lucifer, which means the light bearer. It's one of the names of God. How, why would somebody in that position, standing next to the throne of God, allow himself to be so self-deceived and, and, and allow to, himself to be so overcome with selfish ambition to do what he did? Well, if he could explain it, words of Ellen White, it, you could find an excuse for it. You, you, yeah. it it's not possible really yeah. to, to find an excuse for it. To turn from giving what God has given you to give, because he's the giver of all mm -hmm. good gifts, to wanting mm -hmm. more. It's, it's like the difference between the light bearer, you know, the mm -hmm. Lucifer and, and a black hole that mm -hmm. draws everything in. Yeah. And, and just think, what we are supposed to do as Christians is to go just the opposite. We're supposed to grow, for, grow up from being wanting everything to wanting to give. And, Lu and Lucifer just went just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Well, our Bible study guide suggests that the ultimate sin is selfishness or even narcissism, which one dictionary defines as inordinate fascination with oneself, self-love, Vanity. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you think of some characters in the Bible explicitly mentioned who could be described as narcissistic? That shouldn't be too hard. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And you know about the, you know the story of why he had all those hanging gardens and everything? Why was that? Keep the place cool for his wives. He, well, he married a Med Median wife, and she came from the mountains, and she wanted that environment. And here he is out here living on the flat plains that are hot as, as Hades almost, and, and, you know, and whatever, but there's enough water there. They had the Euphrates River. And so he said, well, I'll fix it up for you. And so he tried to create the forest environment from her native land there in in a Babylon and end up making one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Can you think of another narcissist? What about Judas Iscariot? Yeah. He's got to be an extreme in that area. Well, remember the, remember the Pharisee who prayed? Oh, yes. Lord, I think. Let me just read that. The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, that I'm not greedy dishonest or an adulterer like everybody else. I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I fast two days a week and I give you a tenth of all my income. Wow. 
Do you know anybody today who's a little bit like a Nebuchadnezzar or a Pharisee? Do you want us to name names or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, 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 hold yeah, on. With that one. <laughs> Maybe if it's a very public figure, you <laughs> No, I, let's, let's not name any names. Wouldn't you have to make some judgments to come up with something like that? I, I would be yes, brave yes. enough to say that Hollywood is full of them. Yes. Well, as long as we're not like that, I guess, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, who said that? <laughs> probably the most, probably the most comprehensive and succinct comment about money in the Bible is found in First Timothy six ten. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. That doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? So why does the love of money lead to many sorrows and broken hearts? Because you can never have enough. <clears throat> you got to work yourself to the bone. You still don't have enough, right? Take advantage of people. Uh, if you can get away with it. Well, neglect people because neglect. you don't have time for them. You've got to yep. make money. So do you know any rich people who think more highly of themselves than they should? We won't mention any names. Do we know any people who think <laughs> more highly of themselves <laughs> yeah, than they right. should? Are they more inclined to be self-absorbed, proud, even boastful? You remember Philippians 2, verse 3? Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. Is, is that possible for a naturally selfish human being? Not for a natural person, but a spiritual person. Okay, how do we get over that mm, away from the selfishness to the, to the loving? Must be born again. Must be born again. Is that an instantaneous transformation? Well, that, that connection, I mean, you plug a socket, in, you know, a cord into the wall and you suddenly have power. Mm -hmm. uh, whether your computer is reprogrammed <laughs> as a result of that yeah. is another matter. Well, back in Exodus, as we know, God chose the people of Israel as his special possession shortly after they left Egypt, or chose them to bring them out of Egypt, pre presumably because of their ancestors. But can you think about how crazy that would have looked to anybody living at that time in history? I mean, if you're going to pick out a special people, and you want them to be powerful and influential, you would have chosen, you know, maybe the Mesopotamians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. Why would you choose a bunch of slaves? Ex-slaves. Well, of course, he promised to Abraham. Yeah. And these were Abraham's descendants, so. Okay. And that he said he was are you trying to see? Are you trying to suggest that God didn't know in advance? No, because he said he, they would go down there in, in yep. 400 years or 430, depending on where you start the, yeah. the statement from, uh, um, God would bring them out again. Mm -hmm. look, at, um, look at Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, then you will be my own people. A people dedicated to me alone, you will serve me as priests. Okay? Well, does that sound like any other verses you might have read in the Bible? Well, Peter says... Yeah, what did Peter say? Kingdom of priests. He said, yeah, I know about that verse talking about the Jews in the Old Testament. They failed. But now, Christians are supposed to take the place of those Jews. So what he said, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are the chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation, God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous life, light. Well, can we have the kind of relationship with God that would really make a difference in our lives? Is that possible in our generation? Jesus told us that without him we can do nothing. 
if we are connected to Jesus as the branch is connected to the vine, incredible things can happen. Myra, are you willing to take on that next passage there? Sure. Uh, this is from Desire of Ages, page 664. He came to the world to display the glory of God, that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifest in him that he might be manifest in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all of his followers may possess if they would be in subjection to God as he was. Does that seem like completely out of the realm of possibility? It does, and I heard a reference to something recently. Um, I don't remember just when it was, just the other day. Perfection. Mm -hmm. Do we aim for this perfection and lose sight of, of what the real value is in having that relationship with God? Well, sometimes goal, having a goal can be a problem, you know, if somebody wants to grow up to be rich and famous or something like that. Um, and then in the process they, they sacrifice morality and all kinds of things in order to get to that goal. Uh, it's better to, to develop skills and those skills will then bring you, you know, as the proverb says, the man who is skillful in his trade will stand before kings. Mm -hmm. So if your goal is to stand before kings, then, uh, you know, you're not just trying to figure out some way to sneak into the palace. You, mm -hmm. you, you start with the skills and, and those skills will take you where God wants you to, to be. But Jesus, I'm quoting now again, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men, and I would add women, may not have through faith in him. Where are the Jesuses in our day? Well, we have to start with the relationship that mm -hmm. he, he had, which is what it says there is uh, that relationship that he had with God. And if we have that, God can work in us the, the works, you know, and, mm -hmm. and somebody will go this way and somebody will, God will take this, another way to bless humanity and mm -hmm. try to do his work. We, we, we don't always know where we're going to end up yeah. uh, in, in his work. What, why, are, why are possessions and materialism such an attraction to us? Can they become almost synonymous with our identity? Well, in other words, I'm important because I live in a big house, I drive a nice car, I have a high position, or am I important because I live a life like the life of Jesus. Does our identity really depend on what we own or what owns us? To some it might. Mm -hmm. Jim, talking, you want to read that? Oh, go ahead. We're talking a lot about problems with the heart. Mm -hmm. um, the heart can't really be explained and taken apart like we're trying to do here. Um, so I think there's there's some things we're kind of missing here just because of of our disposition at the moment. Paul did that. Lots of Bible writers did that. You know, the old man of sin and blah, 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 you know, and then there's a new babe and so forth. Well, Jim, there's a passage there that from testimonies. Could you read that for us? The enemy is buying souls today very cheap. Ye have sold yourselves for naught. Isaiah 52, 3, King James Version, is the language of Scripture. One is selling his soul for the world's applause, another for money, one to greatly base passions, Gratitude. excuse me, gratify base passions, another for worldly amusement. Such bargains are made daily. Satan is bidding for the purpose, purchase <coughs> of Christ's blood and buying them cheap notwithstanding the infinite price which has been paid to ransom them. Ellen White, or E.G. White, 
Testimonies of Church, Volume 5, page 133.4. So how about that? Do we put most of our confidence in our 401ks? Or a treasure that w what, we, what we have stored up somewhere in the bank, or projects, or buildings, or business? Or could we come to a place where we trust solely on God himself? It is virtually impossible to exist in a modern society without having some money. It is our means of exchange. So how do we keep a proper biblical balance? And, and may I remind us, as we're just passing by here, Revelation 13 says the day is coming when we will not be able to buy or sell. I know exactly how that's going to work out. But. Well, I could even say that, that you can't buy or sell without a number. I, I think, remember, Jesus uh, was asked, how would we know that you're coming back? Or what, what are the signs? Well, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and, and earthquakes and so forth. Well, they have always been wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. I think it's just as surely as that is, he could. T he foretold a time where you can't buy or sell. It's just another reminder. What do we get worried about? It's a six, 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 six. The number six is in numerology is just an evil number. It's just a bad, bad thing when people are of no more value than they are in number. Yeah. And I think that's really what it's trying to yeah. say. When, I, I, or, you know, it's just another way of looking at it. I, I should comment about that earthquake and natural disaster things. I recently saw someone did a research on natural disasters. We went back through history. In, in the last 10 years of the 20th century, there were 50 times as many major earthquakes as there were in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. it just in one, one century, the, the, evil, the natural disasters had increased 50 times. But one way to look at it is it's a reminder yeah. that he is, Jesus is sure. coming back. And yeah. to be setting dates and times, uh, our priorities are out of, out of work, out of focus. Jesus told us to lay up treasure not here on this earth, but in heaven. How do we do that? We use it to God's glory. Mm -hmm. If we use what, what we have to God's glory, yes. So do we have any real appreciation for what we could do for God by the use of the means that we have available to us even now? If we really study the life and death of Jesus Christ and begin to comprehend all that he has done for us, does any return we might make to him seem excessive? How can we make sure that not only our money but also our time and our talents are used for the promotion of God's cause? What are some ways that we can do that? The Adventist Church, by, by the standards of, of other churches, by comparison with other churches, is growing phenomenally. Uh, there are only a few other churches, primarily Pentecostal groups, that are, are growing as fast as we are growing. But don't you, what, what would happen if even a small percentage of the total Adventist Church were totally committed to, to teaching the truth, to spreading the gospel like the apostles were in Jesus' day, you think it would make a difference? Yeah, I think it could. Depends how it's done. Yeah. <clears throat> Jesus told the parable of the, of the tares, the wheat and the tares. And he suggested that maybe the attractions of this world are like those tares that make it hard for the wheat. Um, in this lesson, we are told that materialism is our, quote, primary stumbling block to faithful service. You think that's really true? It's interesting to note that some of the most respected saints of the Old Testament were also very wealthy. We've already mentioned Abraham and Job. What about David and Solomon and Boaz? By contrast, there were people like Achan. For a paltry Babylonian garment, some silver and a gold bar, he sold himself and his family into perdition. Well, think back to the time when you were a child. There might have, you, if you're a, like a lot of children, maybe there was something, maybe it was a rag doll or, or a stuffed, stuffed toy that you just couldn't, you couldn't sleep, you couldn't do anything without that toy. But you don't care about it, you don't, probably don't even know where it is now. So how did your values change? What caused that change? We, we have grown up and we... Shifted our focus. 
shifted our focus. Well, they say when you have a, a baby, and life changes, all your values change right there. I can attest to that. I know what it's like. Yeah. Romans 12.1 tells us we're supposed to give God reasonable service. We don't have time to look at that passage in detail, but I can tell you that the word reasonable comes from a Greek word, logikain, which, from which we get our word logical. It, it's, it's, it's sensible, it makes sense, it's, it's an intellectual thing. And the word service comes not from service of a slave or service of a, of a even indentured service of some, servant of some kind, but it's a, it's a service that's offered by a priest or a Levite. So what we're really talking about is intelligent worship. That's what God is looking for. Not dead pigeons, dead lambs. He's looking for people who are willing to give him intelligent service. Uh, are we prepared to do that? Is it for his benefit or for ours? Well, I mean, God is in, not in need of worship. No. It's, we, we need to look at the ideal and, and uh, what was it? Uh, it's the law of the mind that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And nowadays we're constantly uh, informed of what a false or faulty concept of God does. Yeah. People become uh, yeah. terrorists. We so. are, we're running out of time, but in one place it says God loves the world, but another place John, the same writer, says we're not supposed to love the world. Well, and of course, you recognize that we use the words, those terms like that all the time. God was talking about the people of the world, and, and, and John, and uh, talking about us, we're, we love the things of the world and so forth. And then he goes on in our lesson, and I hope you have a chance to look at this, explaining what the lust of the flesh is and the lust of eyes and the pride of life. But we're going to have to leave it there. We hope you've learned something from our time together, and thank you very much for joining us. Our kind and wonderful Father, as usual, we are challenged by these lessons. We're seeking to understand you better, and always more questions raise more, give us more opportunities to think. May we think clearly about you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.